Let's continue our discussion of current flow. So we've talked about the general current equation. We've talked about drift current, which is a special case. In this lecture, we'll be talking about diffusion current, which is another special case. Well, we saw in the last lecture that when the carrier densities are spatially uniform, then we have drift current, simply proportional to the electric field. What if the carrier densities aren't constant? That's the subject of this lecture. So we'll assume there's no electric field, but there could be a gradient in the carrier density. So the topics that we'll discuss are Fick's law of diffusion. So this has been known for a long, long time. And we'll show how that leads to hole and electron currents. We'll discuss just a little bit the physics of diffusion. And then we'll go back and relate it to our general current equation. Well, what's Fick's law of diffusion? You've probably seen this in a freshman chemistry course. If we've got a non-uniform concentration of particles, in our case it might be the density of holes in the valence band, then there will be a flux, a flow of particles from high concentration to low concentration. And that flux, the number per square centimeter per second, uh, is something that Fick's law of diffusion describes for us. So that flux is proportional to the concentration gradient, and the constant of proportionality is the so-called diffusion coefficient, the diffusion coefficient of holes. It has the units of, you know, the proper units are meters squared per second. Semiconductor people typically quote them in centimeters squared per second. And in three dimensions, the flux would be minus diffusion coefficient times the gradient of the hole concentration. All right, exactly the same thing for electrons. Electrons are particles. They flow down their concentration gradient. Uh, the flux is given by Fick's law of diffusion. The diffusion coefficient is the electron diffusion coefficient instead of the hole diffusion coefficient. And again, we can write that in 3D if we, if we wish to. So it has nothing to do with the charge. Particles flow from high concentration to low concentration, any type of particle in random thermal motion. Well, what about currents? Well, we simply have to multiply you know, the, the flux of particles. They're carrying their charge with them. Um, the charge is positive for holes, so there will be a whole current in the direction of the flux, in the positive x direction. And that whole current will be interested in the current density, amps per square centimeter. So all we have to do is to take the whole flux, multiply by the charge Q, and we have the whole diffusion coefficient. Now for electrons, we have electrons moving from high concentration to low concentration, but electrons have a negative charge. So in this case, the electron diffusion current moves in the opposite direction of the electron flux. So we simply multiply by the charge, it's negative now, and we get an expression for the electron diffusion current. So note, how, note here that the electron diffusion current and the whole diffusion current have opposite signs. In the drift current, they had the same sign. And that happens because we had two occurrences of the negative charge. Uh, the velocity, uh, the electrons moved it minus the direction of the electron of the electric field uh, because force is minus Q times the electric field. But the charge was negative again, so that gave us another minus sign. So both electrons and holes, drift currents had the same sign. The diffusion currents have the opposite sign. Okay, so we could write it in 3D if we want to also. All right, what's the physics? All right, this is what's observed. Particles move from high concentration to low concentration. What is the physics driving this? Well, let's take a look at a specific location, x sub naught. Uh, and remember, lambda is the mean free path. So let me look to the left one mean free path and to the right one mean free path. So in that region, we can essentially say, on average, no scattering is occurring. 
Um, the concentration of holes on the left side is P sub L for left. The concentration of holes on the right side is P sub R for right. And we're interested in what is the net current in the middle of this region. And it will be, well, there will be holes moving from the left to the right on the left side, and there will be holes moving from the right to the left on the other side, and we simply subtract those two, and that's the net hole current in the positive x direction. All right, so let's take a look at that. Uh, the positive flux coming into this point at x naught, well, the cu current, remember current was charge times carrier density times velocity. Well, there's no scattering going on here, so they're moving at the thermal velocity. You can see a charge Q there, but only half of them are moving in the positive direction. Remember, it's random thermal motion. The other half are moving in the negative direction. So we have the factor of two there, since we're only interested in what is the positive hole current coming in from the left. All right, same thing from the right. All right, only half of the holes on the right have a negative velocity, so we get a factor of two there, and that represents the current flowing in from the right. If we want the net current at x equals x naught, we just subtract the two. So you can see that we're subtracting the two there. Let me multiply and divide by the mean free path, and you can see that you know the center of the region on the right and the center of the region on the left are separated by a distance of one mean free path. So this looks like I'm taking a derivative in the whole density. And in fact, that's what I am. And if we lump these constants together, we've derived Fick's law of diffusion, of diffusion currents. And we also have derived an expression for the diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient depends on the thermal velocity. Remember, this is all driven by random thermal motion. The higher the temperature, the higher the random thermal velocity, and the higher the diffusion coefficient. Uh, the mean free path for scattering, the more scattering, the shorter that is, the harder it is for particles to diffuse a distance. So it's proportional to the mean free path. And then there's a factor of two there. So just like we had a simple expression for the mobility, Q tau over M, we have a simple expression for the diffusion coefficient. Thermal velocity times mean free path divided by two. Now, there's another way that we can look at the physics here. Let's assume that at t equals zero, we put a thousand holes bunched up in a very thin region right near x equals zero. And they're in random thermal motion. And let's let them go. You know, half of them will be going in the positive x direction half of them will be moving in the negative x direction. If I wait until one scattering event and ask what's happened, well, 500 of them have moved to the right and 500 have moved to the left. So after one scattering time, this is the situation that I'll get. Okay, again, they're in random thermal motion. Half of the 500 are moving to the left, half are moving to the right. We can let it go for another scattering time and we'll get a picture that will look like this. So again, they're in random thermal motion. The ones that are in the 250 bars, half of them will move to the left, half will move to the right. The ones that are in the middle here, 250 will move to the left, 250 will move to the right. After one more scattering time, we get a picture that looks like this. And you can see what's happening. This high concentration at one point is spreading out and we're diffusing down the concentration gradient and spreading things out. So if we just continue another scattering time, we'll get something like this. And if you actually solve this problem mathematically by solving a diffusion equation, you'll find out that if we started with a delta function at t equals zero, and we let these holes diffuse for a time t, we'll get a Gaussian distribution that looks like this with a standard deviation that's proportional to the square root of diffusion coefficient times time. That's actually reasonably useful to remember that the distance that particles will diffuse in a time t is square root of dt. Depending on the specifics of the problem, there may be a numerical factor on the order of unity there. But square root of dt is 
roughly the distance over which particles diffuse in random thermal motion. Now, sometimes you might wonder, what force is pushing these particles from high concentration to low concentration? When we had a drift current, there was a real force there. It was the force due to the, the electric field that was pushing electrons or holes. The answer in this case is there is no force. This is a purely statistical effect. Just the random thermal motion in the presence of a concentration gradient causes particles to move from high concentration to low concentration. Sometimes people refer to this as a statistical force, but you should think of that as being in quotation marks. There is no physical force driving diffusion. Okay, so we have diff drift currents, uh, we have and diffusion currents. We have diffusion currents and diffusion coefficients. Remember, for the drift current, the key parameter was the mobility. For the diffusion current, the key parameter is the diffusion coefficient. And we have simple expressions for the diffusion coefficient. Well, that's really all that we need to say about diffusion. But let's go back and try to connect it now to our first lecture when we talked about the general current equation. So our general current equation, the most fundamental description of current in a bulk semiconductor is that the current is proportional to gradients in the quasi-Fermi level. And remember, the quasi-Fermi level is this quantity that is analogous to the equilibrium Fermi level, but it's what we use when we're out of equilibrium. Remember, in equilibrium, there is a one Fermi level that applies to both electrons in holes. We'll discuss quasi-Fermi levels a little more in the next unit, and we'll find that there are two quasi-Fermi levels, one for electrons and one for holes. Okay, so what is the gradient of the quasi-Fermi level in this case? Well, we simply go back to our definition that relates the electron density to the quasi-Fermi level. We solve for the quasi-Fermi level, and we take its gradient. We're assuming there's no electric field. That means the bottom of the conduction band will be spatially uniform, so we won't get any contribution to the derivative there. We'll differentiate the logarithmic term, and we'll get an expression for the gradient of the quasi-Fermi level. We'll put that in our current expression, We'll rearrange some terms, and we'll see that the current is Q times some terms in, in parentheses here, times the gradient of the electron density. Well, that looks an awful lot like our diffusion current. Indeed it is. But in the process of doing this, we have discovered that there is an intimate relation between the diffusion coefficient and the mobility. The fusion coefficient is kT over Q times the mobility. That's a very important thing, very important concept, and one that you'll want to remember. Uh, that relationship is actually called the Einstein relation. And it was discovered by Albert Einstein quite some time ago, uh, 1905. So the way to remember it is d over mu is equal to kT over Q. Does it matter whether it's for electrons or whether it's for holes? D over mu is equal to kT over Q. So if I know the mobility, I know the diffusion coefficient. Okay. All right, so we've been discussing what causes current to flow. Well, concentration gradients can cause current to flow. Electric fields can cause currents to flow. But these are just special cases of the fact that what really causes current to flow is a gradient in the quasi-Fermi level. So just to summarize, we have this very general current equation. Oftentimes in semiconductor problems, we will either be dealing with a case where only the electric field is important or only the concentration gradient is important. So we will oftentimes talk about drift currents and diffusion currents. When both are important, we could add the two, or we could use our more general, more fundamental current expression. Current is proportional to gradient in the quasi-Fermi level. Okay, so we have 
pretty much uh, wrapped up things. Um, in general here, we, we've talked here in the last two lectures about what happens when there's an electric field, what happens when there's a concentration gradient. In general, we have both, and that's the subject of the next lecture.